Welcome to our second session of the School of Ministry. I pray that all of you here and all of you that are watching via the internet, through TV, and through the World Wide Web, and all around the different places that this is being viewed, and also if you are watching it on, or listening to it on CD or on DVD, watching it, it's a great course for you to have come, people come to your house and show it, and then have Bible studies in your own home, because everybody needs to be in ministry. There is no respecters of person. Every single one of you have gifts and talents. In our last session, we talked about uh, people wanting position. We talked about people wanting to be at the left hand of God or the right hand of God. And that Jesus got them all together and had a little chit-chat with them and said, you do not look for position. He said, if you want to be the greatest of all, you need to be the servant of all. And God wants all of us to be servants. So how do we get into that gift and calling that God has called us into? How do we get ourselves lined up so we can be all that God wants us to be? So first of all, I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to start in verse 1. Hebrews 12, 1. It says in verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So what will keep you from finishing the race? Heavy weights of sin. You cannot get into the call of God if you're walking in sin. You have to know that you're going to endure. We shared in our first session that it's not easy. We shared that there's the good, the bad, and the ugly, and ugly things happen to people, but you cannot let that stop you. You have to forgive people and go forward. So how do we go forward? It says there's a great cloud of witnesses of saints that have gone before us. Have we had people that we know that are already in heaven that have finished their course? And it's wonderful. We know that there's great missionaries in heaven and great men and women of God in heaven. But there's some that went to heaven and didn't finish their course. Now, when they got there, God wasn't going to ball them out or anything, I don't think. But he does have a day where he'll ask us, what did you do with the talents I gave you? Do you remember the story of the five talents and he gained five more? And the one had two talents and he gained two more? And the one buried his talent in a hole in the ground and thought that his master would not take care of him. Well, what did the Lord say? He said to the one that had five talents that got five more, well done, good and faithful servant, into the joy of the Lord. He said to the one that did two and got two more, well done. It's not how much you do. I want you to get this. It's not how much you do. God doesn't want you to be a workaholic for him. But what he wants you to do is he wants you to find out what his plan for your life is. And whatever, whatever that plan is, do it. That means if God speaks to you about doing a particular thing, you need to be obedient. And then when you're obedient to everything God tells you to do, then when you stand before God one day and he says to you, well done, because whatever I told you to do, you did. It could be small things. How do you get started in ministry? How do you get started in ministry? It's the simple things. I shared in the last session that you need to be a servant. Now I'm going to share this. The Bible says in, in Matthew that if you even give a drink of water to a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. Is that not true? So what you make happen for someone else, God will eventually use you. So I got that scripture in my head, and so I want to share with you that I, I got that scripture that you've got to start and do not despise the day of small things. So don't even despise taking baby steps. Because if you're not taking baby steps, then you're never going to get to bigger steps. In fact, I was just talking to somebody just about five minutes before I got up here 
to preach. And they said, I realize now that I'm doing little baby steps of sermons, and maybe they're only like one minute or half a minute or maybe a minute, minute and a half, little sermons, but that's a start not realizing that person just said that to me, that that could be the start of bigger sermons and bigger sermons and then maybe one day preaching. You don't know when God tells you to do something simple and you volunteer to do it for free because you love God. Everything isn't about money. Yes, it does take money to, to, to run the ministry. It takes money to run this church. It takes money to run the TV network that you're watching this on right now. But what our heart should be, it's all about people and being a servant. And so you do not despise the day of small things. You don't know where that small thing that you did is going to take you somewhere else. Okay. Pastor Doug, I, I went to Pastor Doug, my pastor. Now he was a very young pastor. He was only in his 20s. Came straight out of Christ for the Nation and you know, I was quite, quite a bit older than him. But so you don't get an attitude about, well, the pastor's just a young kid. So no, he's still the pastor. We respect the official offices that God puts on people. That's what I talked in the first session. God placed them as gifts, so you honor that gift. So then anyway, so I went to my pastor. I said, Pastor Doug, what could I do in the church that nobody else wants to do? And he said, well, nobody wants to put rubber gloves on and clean the toilet bowls. Now, at that time, I had a business, and my business had a janitorial service, and we had money to pay for the janitorial service. I could have very easily said, well, I'll have the guy that does our building come over and do your building, and we'll just pay the bill. But then I am not being a servant. You follow? I might be a giver, but I'm not being a servant. So I said, no, no, no. I don't want my, my other person, the guy that's cleaning our building, to get rewards. I want to start out. So I said, I'll do it. And little by little, it went from the toilets to chairs to vacuuming chairs to putting out flyers. And then the speakers coming, and I was going out putting out flyers. And then I asked if I could take people out on the streets. Anyway, to make a long story short, do not despise the day of small beginnings because we all start out here. You know, it would be like somebody coming in and saying, okay, I would like a job with your corporation, but I don't want to start out at, uh, you know, at the bottom. Even in the job world, you start out at the bottom and then you get a raise and you move up to another position. And you don't, you don't go in and say, I want the position of the president of the company. They're going to look at you like, say, yeah, right. So would everybody else. You start out and work your way up. And that's what God wants. And now watch, look what it says. So we have a whole host that have run ahead of us, finished their course, and stood before God. Look, chapter 2. I mean, chapter 2. Hebrews 12, 2. I mean, uh, verse 2, I'm sorry. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, Okay, if you read a book by an author, you don't start out by reading the book in the middle of the book, do you? You start at the beginning of the book, and you read the book till you come to the end of the book. Is that not right? The author? So you start at the beginning, and you end at the end. So what I'm saying is do not despise the day of small beginnings. Let Jesus take you on a journey. Let Jesus open the pages to your book. So, so when you start out, it might just be writing a book. You, you don't think it's writing a book, but it's like I can share now, starting cleaning the toilets, then I move to here, and then I move to here. So now I'm on page four. And then a little later, I finally get to go on a mission trip, and I'm maybe on page 25. A little later, I get to do a Bible study in my house, and I'm on page 50. What I'm saying is, like the author, which is Jesus, and the finisher, which is Jesus, take control of our day, every day, every day. And he'll take us from page to page, to chapter to chapter. And with, before we know it, we're going like, wow, I'm a minister. Wow, I'm doing the work God called me to. Wow, I'm living out my fulfillment. And I feel great because I'm just coming along good. Don't put the book down. So how do you keep the pages of this book of your life 
going. It says in Jude 20, you can write that down, Jude 20. Jude 20. In Jude 20, it says, Build yourself up in your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. The more you pray in the Holy Ghost, the more you pray in the Spirit, the more you yield your life. You know, Catherine Kuhlman said something. Most of you know who Catherine Kuhlman is. And if, if you're in some other country and you're, and you're watching this, you might be saying, who is, who is Catherine Kuhlman? But anyway, Catherine Kuhlman had a wonderful, wonderful ministry. And she, she filled coliseums. I mean, she didn't fill them. God filled them. And she, was, uh, she, she would pray all day long and pray in the spirit for five and six hours before she'd come out on the pulpit. And all of a sudden, people would be healed here and diseases would fall off. And all kinds of people were miraculously healed. And they asked her, how did you, how did you get to this place where whole coliseums are filling up and people are waiting to get in? She said, it's God. It's all God. And so one thing I want you to all know, as a servant of God and a minister, and you want to be ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, remember this, all glory and all honor for however God chooses to use you is his. When people start getting healed and people start saying great things about you, shh. They try to say things like, oh, Joan, thank you, you healed us. I said, I didn't heal nobody. Do not. Do not stop them. But you nicely say, no, give all the glory to Jesus. Jesus is the one that died on the cross. Jesus is the one that will birth your ministry. And as your ministry starts to unfold like a flower that's budding, then all glory goes to God. You follow what I'm saying? Because Jesus is the author and the finisher of your faith, and he's going to take you along as he wants. But the more time you spend praying in the Holy Ghost and praying in the Holy Ghost, the more you'll get. It's like the Holy Spirit will be the wind in the sail. The boat's only going to go so fast. You follow? But if you get the wind of the Holy Spirit catching the, those sails, you'll go along in your ministry. And people ask me sometimes, how is it that some people... They get saved and they're in ministry within a year or two or within six months they're in the prison ministry or they're all helping in the house, halfway house or they're working with the food ministry. How is it that some get going so fast and others it takes them years? It has, it has to do with how much time you spend praying and how much time you yield. And what Catherine Coleman said when they asked her, how did you do all this? How did you get this ministry so big and a max huge ministry? And she said, she always said, I don't care if they know who Catherine is. That's what she always said. She said, Catherine died. She says she remembers the day that she was walking down the street, and actually she was, she'd had some problems in her life, and she'd gotten off the call of God, and I want to cover that right now. If you get off the call of God and make a major mistake in your life, it doesn't mean you're done. Are you hearing me? If you make a major mistake in your life, it doesn't mean you're done. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Are you hearing me? The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. What you need to do is repent, get real with God. If you need to sit and get some instructions from some pastors or whatever, or sit down for a little while to get healing, you repent, and then after you repent and get right with God, say, God, stir up those gifts in me again. Because he does not take the gifts away from you. If he's called you to preach or called you into ministry or called you into something, I want you to know, I am teaching you the school of ministry. When you step out and start doing your ministry, are you hearing me? The brighter the light, the bigger the bugs. The stronger the anointing, the more demonic attacks. So we need to remember that when you see a mighty ministry crumble, don't rejoice. You don't know what that minister has combated and combated and combated and combated that finally broke him down to a nervous breakdown or to an affair or whatever. Now, is it right? No. Is it wrong? Yes. But are they finished? No. I'm going to share a story with you. I just, the Holy Spirit told me to share this story. 
You know, I took a team of t teenagers out on the streets. I had about 50-something teenagers in Seattle. The pastor had me treat, teach evangelism all week, and he wanted me to take the youth group out. So I had all this youth group out, and we had made up these sacks with uh, sandwiches in it, a pop in it, an apple, and a bag of chips, and we had hundreds and hundreds of them. And so we went out where all the homeless are walking up and down and getting drunk for the night. And so I had put teams, because when you have that big a group, you can't put them all on one, one street witnessing. So the whole strip where everybody goes up and down, there's a strip and every area has a strip where people hang out, especially in your major cities. So we put some teenagers here, some teenagers up in the, all up and down the strip. And I kind of told them, if there's any problems, come find me. I'll just be back and forth. Well, some teenagers were witnessing to this one area, and they came and got me, and they said, come up and help, because there's a man up there, and they're witnessing to this man, and he keeps harassing our teenagers. So I said, okay, so I'll be right up. So I walked up a few more blocks to where they were, and uh, sure enough, I stood and watched for a while, and these two, t these two teenagers were trying to lead somebody to the Lord, and this man, which had a beer bottle in his hand, it was a little, eh, out there, you know, and he said, and he just said, you shouldn't use that scripture, use this one, and he quoted a scripture. And then they would use a different scripture, because there's several scriptures to bring people to Christ. And they would use a different scripture, and they go, this scripture would have worked better, and he quoted the scripture. The man knew the scriptures, forwards and backwards. And so I went to him, and I said, sir, it sounds like you know the scriptures really well, but you know what? I said, right now, I'm in charge of this. He goes, who, who are you? I said, well, I'm in charge of this group. He goes, yeah, really, and he got really nasty in my face. And I said, I, I want you to stop interrupting these teenagers while they're sharing their faith. He said, well, they need to use better scriptures. I said, they're using fine scriptures. And I said to him, I said, look, they're learning. Let them get some experience because God wants all of us to learn. Are you hearing me? So as, a, as in the school of ministry, don't be afraid to step out. If you mess up a little, it's okay. You follow what I'm saying? I'd rather see you get out there and do something than sit on the pew and be afraid to ever step out and do anything. If you use the wrong scripture, is it going to hurt? The, the word of God will not return void without accomplishing what it's sent forth to do. So, you know, you're still getting it out there. If you went out and maybe fumbled up and you said, oh, I really didn't say the sinner's prayer the right way. Well, it doesn't matter. If they prayed at all, you, you, it's better than you doing nothing. You follow what I'm saying? And how do you learn? You learn by experience. It's like you don't beat up a little child the first time they tie up their shoes and both loops are on the same side. You don't punish a child when they're a little baby and say, come on, you can take the first step. Come on, oh, you fell down. You dodo, dodo, you'll never walk. No, you get them up and say, come on, you can do it. Come on, let's encourage the body of Christ. Let's all encourage each other. So anyway, so he said, he, he said okay, I would. So anyway, pretty soon, a little later, he went, I, they came and got me again and said, he's doing it again. Anyway, three times I had to go talk to him, and the last time he got so mad at me that a demon manifested itself, because there's real demons in the world, lots of them, and as ministers you'll be learning later how to cast out demons. Later you should go to the School of the Supernatural, which I just got through doing a School of the Supernatural. I do two Schools of the Supernatural every year. You need to come to those schools. They're intense on how to cast out devils, how to pray for the sick, but right now I'm teaching the School of Ministry. All right. So I go up there. And he gets upset with me, and he, he says, I don't like you. Well, I knew it wasn't him. It's the spirit in him that don't like me. I don't like you, lady. Anyway, to make a long story short, he, he, he got so upset, the demon got so upset, he decided to hit me. So he took his beer bottle, and he threw it at me. And he threw it at me with such force that I was as close as from here to, you know, just a few feet that it would have probably knocked me out. He threw it with me with all his force, and he had his hands open like this. Beer went out of the bottle all over me. I'm getting covered with beer, but the bottle was stuck to his hand. And he looked at his hand like, what is, and he went like this, trying to figure out why, why the bottle wouldn't come off. So he tried two or three times to throw it at me, and the, my angel, my angel, because we have angels on assignment, that's why we do not need to be afraid to step out and minister. My angel had a hold of his, the bottle here so that I, I mean, I can tell you story after story of how angels have protected me and how the angels will protect you. Then he got very upset, and he got upset. And I said, you know what, sir? I need to pray with you. And he started crying. Oh, I, oh first I did this. I command you, Satan, come out of him. So I did a whole bunch of that, and then he fell down. And anyway, some stuff left, demons. And then we prayed with him. Well, Sunday comes, 
Sunday comes. We got through that night. A lot of great things happened. And Sunday, Sunday morning, I'm preaching in the pulpit. It's a quite big church in Seattle, like three, 400 people. And the youth is all over the place. And all of a sudden, I'm getting up there to preach. I maybe preach a couple of words or a few minutes. And I've got teenagers going like this to me. They're pointing at me like this. And I'm looking over, and they're going. And I'm over there, and they're going. And so I, I, these teenagers are trying to get my attention. So I'm like a little distracted with my preaching. And all of a sudden, I look right here. And here's this man that was throwing beer bottles at me and cussing the teenagers out. And he comes up. Well, the pastor's sitting right here because he just turned the mic to me. Well, you don't always hand somebody a mic that you don't know. I mean, it's not wise to hand people mics that you don't know, you know, in the middle of your sermon. Uh, that's why you have to have discernment of the Holy Ghost. And so he, 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 I didn't recognize who he was till he got closer because he was dressed up. He was like looking like a, you know, drunk and stuff. So he's all dressed up in a suit and nice clothes. And he's right there. And I'm like, oh, this is the guy from last night on the streets. And he walks all the way up to me and says, can I have a word? Could you give me the mic? And I'm like, I looked at the pastor that was sitting in front of me, and I go, pastor? Pastor look, gave me this sign, like, your call. It's like, you do whatever you want to do. It's your, you know, it's your call. So I'm, Holy Spirit, do you want me to give this man the mic? And I heard the Holy Spirit say, yes. The man turned around. It totally changed this whole service. It turned into a move of God that was so awesome. He turned around. He knelt down on the ground and wept and screamed at the top of his voice into this mic, I am a sinner. Oh, God. Oh, God. Please, God. Please, God, forgive me. Well, then all the teenagers came up. I mean, the teenagers were like, whoop, because this is the fruit of their Friday night. I mean, their Saturday night. And they came, and there was a huddle, and they're all praying for him and hugging him, and he's sobbing, and, and the different teenagers that were the closest were just holding on to him. And then pretty soon he calmed down, and he said, can I say something else? And I said, yes, you can. He said, I was a pastor. I pastored a big church. He said, I had a huge congregation about the size of this church. So he had a church of about 500 people. He said, and my wife, which I love dearly, ran off with my associate pastor and got married. And she divorced me. And because of our denomination, all of you out there, because of our denomination, all of you pastors, leaders, because of our denomination, and I'm divorced, our denomination will not let me hold ordination papers as a divorced man, or let me keep my church as a divorced man. He said, and it's not my fault. It wasn't my sin. Right. Are you following? It'd be different if he had the fair. So my denomination said, you can't pastor anymore. We have a new pastor coming in and taking your church that you spent 32 years building because he started as a teenager. And he said, I got, so I was angry at God. I got mad at God and told God, how can you do this to me? I've been faithful to raise the money to build this church. I put the walls and the windows in. I've preached my heart out. I've been out on streets. I made this church grow. I've done all of it for you, God. How can you not spare me? He said, I started just drinking and then getting more drunk and more drunk. He said, but last night, with tears running down his face, he said, last night, I mean, I'm kind of standing there. I don't know how long he's going to preach, but anyway, he's going to preach for a while. He said, last night, he said, when I heard the young teenagers sharing scriptures, all of a sudden, all of that preaching that I've been up all these years, has locked up all these years, locked up all these years. And the scriptures started quoting and quoting and quoting, and the Bible just came back to life. And he said, Pastor, and he walks to the pastor. He says, please find something for me to do. I'm sure God's not through with me, and the call of God is on me so strong, I can't 
just, I'll sit in your church. You can, you can, you can help me, help me, help me, Pastor, get back into ministry because that's the only thing that makes my heart beat. Please, give me a second chance. And I remind you, God is the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. And the devil will do whatever he can to stop you from being in ministry. He will try to get you to lose your church or not have enough money and have to shut the doors. You need to know we're in a war zone. We're in a war zone. Satan comes to kill and destroy. And he wants to take out ministry. And so when you start going to the things that God wants you to walk in, you've got to learn this. You've got to pray and build yourself up. Are you hearing me? You've got to pray and build yourself up. You cannot just go out there and be a minister with no prayer. The more God tells you to step into ministry and ministry and ministry, you need to keep prayed up and you need to learn how to do spiritual warfare before you step through the doors and do ministry. And then when you get through doing an outreach or you get through doing something great or get through, do you remember how Jesus prayed Ten lepers, ten lepers were prayed for, but only one, and Jesus said, only one came back to say thank you. Only one of you came back to say thank you. So when we get through having an awesome service, or we get through having an awesome outreach, or something wonderful God has done through us, don't you think it's wonderful to just get on our faces and, and spend a little time before we go to bed or after the outreach or after you've done something and say, thank you, almighty God, thank you. Thank you for using me. Thank you for the people that got saved. Thank you for the anointing while I preach. Or thank you for giving me the ideas to, to do whatever God tells you to do. Because God will do it. God, God will do it. He will. He will do it. So it says, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. It says, so looking unto Jesus, I'm still, Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, whom for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Now, come on, everybody. Are you following along with me? How could you figure it's joy to take the cross? How can you figure that he endured hostility against sinners and he counts it all joy to go to the cross? You know why he counts it all joy? Because he knows that unless he goes to the cross, that you won't be sitting here in this chair or watching by TV or watching on a DVD or listening to this on CD because he will change you. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things passed away and behold, you are new. God is making you new. So the devil is the accuser of the brethren and I'll be sharing that tonight tonight or at our next session actually in our next session about the accuser of the brethren then it goes on and it says oh, looking unto Jesus the author and the finish of our faith whom for the joy that was set before him endured endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of glory for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself Least you, wanting to step into ministry, least you become weary and discouraged in your soul. You, not one of us here, me included, you have not yet resisted for the shedding of blood, striving against sin. So none of us have, have big gouges in our bodies. We don't have big knife wounds or have, do we have big scars from where nail went through our wrist. So what is our light afflictions? So what I'm saying as ministers of the gospel, if somebody tells you off now and then, count it all joy. Are you hearing me? Everybody isn't going to want to hear everything you do. Everybody isn't going to want to be part of your ministry. Everyone, when you start to step out into ministry, the Bible says, and you can turn to it, Matthew chapter 10. Just turn to Matthew chapter 10 right now. Matthew chapter 10. Just go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 10. Verse 32. Matthew 10, 32. Therefore, whoever confesses me before man, him 
I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before man, him I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. All right? I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. I'm going to share a story, a little story. I have to share these stories as the Holy Spirit tells me to, and um, sometimes the people in the audience don't want to hear the story. But anyway, I have a story to share because I have to do what the Holy Spirit says. When it says there in the scriptures that you have to love God more than father, mother, son, daughter. Do you all follow what I'm saying? My daughter, when she was 16 years old, or 17, I'm not sure, had some problems in her life, which we have all. I mean, you could go back to my testimony. You can pick up my testimony tape on the book table. I mean, I was one mess. One mess. I mean, I ran away from home and just made a mess of my life. So I understand how the enemy will come. What I'm saying is when you are a minister of the gospel, the enemy will come, first of all, to try to get you. Are you all following me? And then he'll go after your kids. Are you hearing me? If he can't get to you, he'll get to the thing that's the closest to you because he knows that's going to hurt your heart. You follow what I'm saying? And I wasn't the sweetest mother anyway. Okay. So um, my daughter and I are driving to San Jose, California, and on the way to a church service, we made a deal that if she would come with me on the road, that uh, she could run the book table, and I'd give her $50 every time she ran the book table so she could have some pocket money while she's with me. Well, we're on our way to San Jose to preach in this church, and we get into it. I mean, you know, you don't want to get into an argument and a debate and an argument just before you go in the pulpit. It's not the best time to have an argument with your family. But sometimes your family, you know, and, but you have to go forward. You cannot let your family keep you back. Are you following? Because Jesus said, if your family comes first and then I come second, that's not the way it goes. God is first. Family, second. Then ministry. Are you following me? Did you catch that? Family, God first, family, and then ministry. Not God, ministry, family. Because you also have to be ministers to your children because if you get so caught up in the ministry, you will lose your children. Are you following? They're the closest to you. So anyway, we got in this fight. And so as we're going into the church, I'm not going to do your book table, and I don't care. I went, fine, don't do the book table. She said, I really, and she was having trouble. I don't really like having you as a mom because this, this, you know, you're a minister and I have to sacrifice. It's truth. Listen to me. My, my daughter and my boys have sacrificed. My husband right now is sacrificing. There is sacrifices that, are, that come along with the ministry. I can't tell you how many Christmases I haven't spent with my kids, how many times I wasn't there for the kids' uh, birthday parties or whatever because I'm preaching here or on a mission trip here or here. So what she was saying was truth. It's hard being, it's hard being a daughter to you, mom, because you're not a normal mom. And then it hurt me when she found somebody else that could be like her mom because I couldn't be her mom. And she found this old lady that said she'd be like a mom to her. Well, that hurt me. But I said, no, God, that can't hurt me because my daughter needs somebody that would be a mom to her. And if I can't be there for her, then I'm going to pray that this lady will be good to her. So here she is. She's a teenager. But I want to show you how good God is. So... The praise team is up in front. The praise team is up in front singing and preparing, practicing, practicing for that service. Carrie's sitting down here in front of me. I set up the book table, 
and I'm sitting behind her. And the song leader, now come on, there's nobody in the church. Are you getting this? You've got to get this. There's nobody in the church except me and Carrie and the praise team. Are you following it? We're early, me, Carrie, and the praise team. And all of a sudden, while they're practicing singing, one of the ladies that's up there practicing singing gets a prophetic word in the practice. I'll never forget it, I about fell over. And the song was, I see your heart, my daughter, how hard it is to be, mer to be a daughter of a minister and how it's cost you everything. But, I, but I've called your mama and I will protect you. And it went on and on. And, you know, the, probably the lady up there singing is going like, what? What kind of song am I singing? It was all about, I know your heart. I know how hard it is for you to be a minister's daughter, but I will give you the love that you can't receive from your mom. I've called her, just understand, and it went on and on and on. Well, I knew that song wasn't for anybody else in the building. The only ones there was me and Carrie. Carrie started crying. I started crying. I was sitting behind Carrie, and I reached my hand over to see if she'd receive me, and she grabbed my arm, and we got together and hugged each other and loved on each other because God saw so what I'm saying to all of you, if you love father, mother, children, you, you let God deal with the children. You follow the call of God. You follow the call of God. It's got to be God first. God will bring your children around. He will bring them around. He will protect them and bring them around. Now, there's more to that story. I had told my daughter that she would get $50 for running the book table. Well, that day she never did run the book table. She didn't. Sunday morning, she did not run the book table. And Sunday night, she did not want to go back with me to church, which is okay. Sunday night, she did not go back with me. I left her back at the apartment. Some lady walks up to me, I have no idea who, and says, this card is for your daughter. I didn't know what was in the card, but when I gave it to, to my daughter that night, she opened it up, and I don't remember what it all said, but I do remember that it had the $50 that she was going to get for running the book table, even though she didn't. Is our God good? Our God is good. So what I'm saying, it goes on and it says, it goes on and it says, um, Verse 37, he who loves father, mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not pick up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives um, a righteous man in the name of righteousness shall receive a righteous man's reward. Verse 42. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a, in, in the name of a disciple, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. So what I'm saying is, I started out with this session about cleaning the toilet bowls at our church and being a servant. In session one, we talked about being a servant. To be the greatest of all is to humble yourself. So as you start out by being a s servant and doing the, gar the work God's called you to, whether it's helping people, running the book table, whatever you need to do, then as you're faithful and you're a servant under somebody else, then eventually you will have your own ministry. For the first three years I was in ministry, I wasn't the minister, main minister. I humbled myself and worked under another ministry and just waited and served them. Of course, they let me preach and everything, but then little by little, I moved up, and they, then, they, then they helped me get started in our own ministry. We're to help people get into ministry and do the work that God's called us to work in. So go back with me now to another scripture I want to take you now. To Luke, I want you to take. I want to take you to Luke, chapter ten. Go with me to Luke, chapter ten. Luke. Luke, chapter ten.
The Lord has given us all authority to do the work that God's called us to do. In Luke chapter 10, I want you to see. He sent out, first he sent out the 12, and then later he sends out the 70. And when the 70 returned in Luke 10, 17, then the 70 returned with joy, saying, even, Lord, even demons are subject to us by your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. The story I shared with you about the man trying to hit me with the beer bottle, he couldn't. The minute he took that beer bottle and pointed it in a different direction other than me, it flew out of his hand and broke on the sidewalk. We have angels that will watch over us. And it says here, And the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your name is written in heaven. So when you, when you believe God and step out to do the things of God, you've got to remember that God is working with you. God is working with you. He is not leaving us out there alone. He is working with us so that we're not alone. We have angels on assignment. We have angels on assignment, and we have the third person of the Holy Spirit operating through us, which we'll be learning in the next session about how to to trust the Holy Spirit and lean on the Holy Spirit and learn from the Holy Spirit. And God wants us to do that. And then he wants us to be servants because as we're obedient to do what God tells us to do, do not need to be afraid. You get out and do the servant part of God. You get out and do the love part of God and love people. And you take care of God's work and his kingdom come. His work will get done and he will be there for you all the time. And I'll show you what he means. He wants you and I to learn to walk in pure love pure love god is love and we have to love people and we got to love people no matter what we got to love them when they don't smell good we got to love them when they don't feel good we got to love them when they're sick we got to love them if they're crippled we got to love them when they're messed up on drugs and alcohol we got to love them where they're at and help them come up 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 into God's kingdom, knowing that Jesus, only Jesus can set somebody free from alcohol. Only Jesus can fill the marriage, fix the marriage. Only Jesus can change. Only Jesus can do it. But how do we love people? It says here, go with me to Luke. I'm still, we're still in Luke. Now we're going to go to verse 25. Luke 10, 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, Rabbi, he said to him, You answered rightly, do this and you will live. And that's what Jesus said. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who, I want you to underline the words, stripped him of his clothing, underline the word wounded him, underline the word wounded him, and departed leaving him half dead, underline the word half dead. So there's three words I had you underline. One, stripped him, okay, stripped him, wounded him, half dead. Those are the ones I want to, uh, okay, so what happened is how many of you know people that have been stripped of sat by Satan? Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. They've lost their marriages. They've lost their houses. They've lost their car. It was repossessed. Or, or their children are in prison. Uh, people have been stolen, stolen by Satan, okay? How about this? Wounded. Are there any people wounded? Yeah, they're wounded because they've been in a car wreck. They could have sickness, but they could be wounded inside. They could be a wounded spirit. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. 
Sometimes the wounds are not something you can see like a limp or a wheelchair or, or some disease. The wounds are inside. So we can't, he, he says we're to help the, the wounded. Okay. And then left them half dead. Do you ever see anybody half dead? Like they could care less if they live because they're under such severe depression, oppression, that they talk to themselves because they're so lonely. There's a whole lot of people in our country and all over the world that, that like just, they're so bored, they don't have nothing to do, no friends, nobody. They're just lonely, 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 lonely. And they don't care. There's no, no, no vision. They just go, it's just going to be another day, so why bother getting up? And they get more depressed and more depressed until they're like, wish they were dead. They just don't have enough guts to com commit suicide. But they're wishing they were dead. Okay? But a certain, so we know there's all kinds of people like that. In verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. Okay, wait, I've left out something. Verse 31. Now, by chance, a certain priest, I'm on 31, and I want you to put number one on verse 31. Just put somewhere right number one. Just a little number one. First, I'm going to give you three examples here. One, two, and three. Okay, number one. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Oh, you know what's really easy to say? Oh, oh, look at all the problems we have in the world. Look at all the problems we have in the world. There's some people that can get up and stay. Oh, there's this many abortions and this, this many, and this many, this. And they can give you all these statistics, but they're not doing anything about it. We have even churches saying, well, we need to do something about abortion. Well, yeah, well, let's get some posters and go down and, and try to love people before they go in and commit, commit murder. Let's go to the White House and see if we can't change some laws. It's one thing to just hope and pray. It's another thing to put action. So he looks at the situation and he don't want to get involved. Some people can see the situation, but they don't want to get involved. Don't bother me. Let the government take care of it. All right. The next one is two, but two. Verse 32. And likewise, a Levite when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed on the other side. So he takes a better look. One didn't even want to look. The other one now comes over white over the guy and goes, oh, my God, look at you're bleeding. Oh, my God, you don't, you've been stripped. Oh, my God, look at you. Oh, you're a mess. God bless you. Have a great day and leave. Definitely not a doer of the word, okay? And so he passes by too. Number three, verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, just put the little three there. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. You see, God wants us to be like him. And if we're going to be in ministry, this is the school of ministry. If, we need to, if we're going to be in ministry, we need to look for people that we can minister to. We need to have opportunities when we see people hurt, wounded, scarred, and let God lead us so we can minister to them. You follow what I'm saying? And so it said he had compassion on him. So what does he do? So, verse 34. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds and poured on oil and wine and set him on his own animal and took him to an inn and took care of him. All right? Now, let me give you a little story about this. The man is a salesman. He's on his way to make a sales pitch somewhere. He's a salesman, and he's going somewhere to work. He's on his way to work. So the first thing that happens, because of his compassion and following what God would have him do, he has now had an interruption of his time schedule. So I want you to write that somewhere on your notes. If you're going to walk in the compassion of God and be a true servant of God, it's going to be time interruption. Are you following me? Interruption of your time. People don't decide to get in an accident on your time schedule. The husband and wife don't plan to have their fight on the time schedule that's just perfect for you to come over and minister to them. They don't run out, run out of food or gas on your time schedule. You all follow what I'm saying? So it means you've got to make your time, you're going to interrupt your time 
And it takes, if you're going to minister to people, it means turn off the TV. If somebody calls and says, we need help, you just get in your car and you go do it. It's going to mean time and an interruption of your schedule. The second thing you see here is he was riding his own donkey. The next thing it's going to cost you is, is uh, comfort. Comfort. He was riding his own donkey. He is now not riding the donkey. Are you following? He is now walking. The man that is sick and been wounded and beat up is now on the man's donkey. You follow what I'm saying? And he is walking. So it's a discomfort. Not only does it take up your time, but it's a discomfort because now you have to give up something that is yours. You follow? Let me give you an example. Let's find out that the little homeless people have just got, let's just say that there's a little homeless couple that just got saved and, and, and they just barely got enough to get in their welfare apartment. Let's just say that because we've had these cases. I could tell you all kinds of stories of how we've done this. So then we stand at the church and I say, you know what, we just led this little lady to the Lord and she has a baby. In fact, this is a true story. She has a baby and they have no furniture. The baby's sleeping on the floor. She's sleeping on the floor on a blanket. This is a true story. So I said to the church, we got to do something. She just got saved. She just barely had enough money to get in her welfare apartment. She has no money whatsoever, no groceries in the house. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And the pastor was just a small church, and he said, we don't have any money. So we don't have a benevolence fund or whatever that is for extra money. And I said, okay, so we don't have that. So what are we going to do? I was supposed to preach on a Friday night. I said, I'm not preaching tonight then. And they go, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to organize. I said to the church secretary, get a notepad. So she did. I said, okay, the lady has nothing. I'm not preaching tonight. We're going to organize tonight. We're all going to go over there because tonight she's sleeping on the floor, hardwood floor with just a receiving blanket big enough for her, not even big enough, her baby's on it, and she's sleeping on the floor. I said, okay, so it, I'll just make this fast. Who has a bed that can cough up a bed? Well, we have an extra, and then they'd talk for a few minutes, and what, you see a hand go, we have an extra bedroom in, in our guest room, and nobody's, we have no guests right now, we'll give up a bed, we'll give up a sofa, we'll give up, we'll give up, we'll give up, we'll get a stroller, we'll get this, we'll do this, we'll do that. Who will go get a couple hundred dollars worth? No. Nobody said, we don't have groceries, we don't have money. I said, okay, I'll give you $200. You go buy groceries. And then somebody said, I have a whole bunch of beef in the, I had, we just bought a half. Then great, fix that ice chest full of meat. Okay, and then pretty soon, blankets, dish, pots, pans, took us till 10 o'clock at night. Then we had to organize, who has trucks, pickup trucks? Truck, truck, truck. Okay, you, 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 you go, you're gonna go to this house, this house, this house, you're gonna have to pick up this, 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 and you got the picture? We all met at the church. We waited till we had six, seven, eight church uh, backed up, backed up. We drove over there. This little girl about fell over. I'm not kidding. She about fell over. Hi, honey. You asked Jesus into your heart yesterday. You're part of the family of God, and we need to take care of you. Come on in, everybody. She'll never be the same. And, and the, one of the neatest things that happened is this young boy said, it was so cute. He said, I'm going to Rama Bible College. I went, great, that's wonderful. He said, I just saved up enough money for the $72 Schofield Study Bible. So when I go to Rama, he said, she doesn't have a Bible. I said, yeah, but you're going to need that Bible. You're going to Bible College. He goes, I know. But he said, this is my Bible that I was going to take to Rama. I want you to have a Bible. Can I write in here that you got saved yesterday? You know what? Sunday, somebody walked up and said, here is a $500 check to bless you while you go to Rama." That caused that. So what happens? So what happens now is you've got to find a need, and, and what it's going to cost you is discomfort. Discomfort meant that everybody that day when we did this lost the entire Saturday. You follow? Their whole Saturday, whatever they had planned for that Saturday, got altered. My message for Friday night got altered. We didn't even take up an offering that night. 
I ended up giving the money away instead of getting an offering. Are you following? We didn't even think of an offering. We probably should have taken an offering and could have given her more money, but we were too busy organizing. So it's going to cost you your time, your inconvenience, and then it's going to cost the last thing. It's going to cost money. And then it says, he went and bandaged his wounds, poured on the wine, and set up on his own animal, and took him to the inn and took care of him. And on the next day, when he departed, he took out two deniers and gave it to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come, I'll take care of it. So you and I, if we're going to be servants of God, we have to be willing to pour our lives out for others. To say you're a minister and just preach in the pulpit and not be a minister. I mean, yes, I'm a pulpit preacher. I preach in the pulpit. But ministry is way more than putting together sermons. Yes, Jesus was the greatest preacher that ever walked the face of the earth. But he fed the multitudes. And he went to this one's house to pray for him. And he, he took care of uh, Mary Magdalene as she was full of sin and then he prayed for people and then he made the loaves fish and the bread turn into multi he cared for people if we're going to be in ministry and we're saying we want to be ministers then that means we're going to have to get our life so that's involved with people and it means that we have to care more and have God's compassion and heart in our heart and as we get God's compassion in, in our heart then we'll see people restored like the man that was a pastor, restored back into ministry. Like the young girl with the baby on the floor, restored. Into, restored. Our lives need to reflect him. And if we're really going to be a minister, we need to let our lives reflect and be like Jesus. My prayer to each and every one of you is that this course, and those of you watching by TV, and through satellite and listening to DVD, as we go through this whole course, we're just into the second session, but at, by the time we're through with this whole course, you will know what your gifts and callings are. You will know what your destiny is. You will get started on the right path, and you will fulfill what God's plan and purpose for your life is. God bless each and every one of you.